Another way, which is the, the most advantage is the tree hawking, which is the natural way that these birds will kill uh, or pursue and catch their game mm -hmm. because they're always gonna be on the high. They're in a tree and then you become the dog. So you're going around poking into the areas and when the bird spots something, you might or might not see it depending on how far away it busts out from you. Um, but you will see the bird go down. They'll just basically come out of the tree, navigate, and then do a wing over. Or, or That's pursue. so cool. <laughs> it, that, that is why we do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it really isn't about filling your game bag. It's about, right, right. And, and we've seen rabbits that, you know, a bird is pursuing it right on its tail. The rabbits jump and it jumps straight up and the bird misses it. It turns around and runs away. We're just as happy with that rabbit as we are with the bird pursuing it. podcast today we're sitting down with our falconry episode two and uh today we're getting local we've got uh, some folks from the great lakes falconry association uh, abbreviated glfa uh, tim and bonnie here today and they're going to talk to us about falconry here in the midwest how you can get involved uh, they're going to tell us all about the great lakes falconry association and they might even have a bird or two to show us so should be pretty fun, but uh, to start off, I'll kick it over to you all. Um, how about a little introduction? Let us know about what got you into falconry, how long you've been doing it, and uh, kind of why is it something that you, um, is it something that you chose or is it something that chose you, but why, why falconry? What is it about falconry that really uh, grinds your gears? Sure. Well, my story is a little bit different. Uh, my mother actually fell in love with my stepfather, who is, and we call him an artisan falconer, George Richter. Um, he's been in it since before there were even laws and regulations to it. So he was part of the build of the falconry community as we know it today. Um, so just out of pure chance, I had the opportunity to grow up with these birds in my home, literally. <laughs> Um, anywhere from breeding projects all the way up to uh, releasing and uh, increasing numbers in wild populations. So they've done an amazing thing to help wild populations. So um, I've always been involved with falconry. So as long as I can remember, um, at the age of 14, I decided it was time for me to dive in and become a member of the family falconry community as well as the regional falconry community. Um, so I've been in it a little over 12 years, wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at the time I was the youngest falconer, um, at least in the regional area, maybe wow. the country. So it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing for young ones to get into if they don't have that family organization and group. So a master falconer, I'm currently the treasurer of GLFA. So I do the money stuff. Um, and my species of choice right now is North American goshawk. Ooh. Well, One what, question to ask, oh. what did you start uh, flying at 14? Um, I started with an American kestrel, which is the smallest falcon um, that you can work with in the United States. Oh. And then the next year I decided I wanted to go with the red tail. So I ended up getting a big old honking red tail and some of the best years of my life with that bird. That's cool. Yeah. Now, as a, as a female, we're obviously seeing a pretty big uptick in, in, you know, female participation, particularly among, you know, hunting and shooting sports. Are you guys seeing that kind of across the board with falconry, too? Just kind of curious. We certainly are, actually. Um, and it isn't because of, of outreach, necessarily. I think it's because of understanding the availability of it now. Um, there's, there's no restrictions for anybody. As long as you're able-bodied and you can care for the birds, you're welcome. So. Sure. It is an uptick. I love seeing it. And it's really great for the sport um, in general, because we are we are seeing an uptick. So I appreciate Fantastic. bringing that up. Very cool stuff. And, yeah. and Bonnie's mom kind of was ahead of her time with that. Yeah. She actually okay. started a subgroup from GLFA called Lady Hawkers. Um, and there was about 15 ladies that would go out hawking wow. together. 
That's yeah. awesome. And that has actually grown. And I think social media is something that we can thank for that. Um, a lot of the education is happening virtually now and the, you're starting to see that there are these groups. So there is a Lady Hawkers group now. Um, and it's way more than 15 members at this point. They get cool. together for their own meets and it's just a, a way to be fully female and free and not have sure. to worry about, you know, put makeup on in the morning if that's your thing. <laughs> So it's uh, pretty cool that it's it's uh, continued to grow like that. Awesome. So, and I came into it a little bit differently. Um, so I was at a place in my life that I was just looking for something different. Um, I attended a seminar about um, falconry rehab and education um, that SOAR burned at Richter and George Richter's um rehabilitation company, I guess, for lack of better words, organization. Um, so I attended that seminar and then I just started doing things um, for them, working around here because stuff needed to be done. A <laughs> um, bunch of things kept on getting in the way. And then I finally decided, well, I would do the falconry thing. So, and then that's how Bonnie and I met. We fell in love. Good story. Good balcony. Now, yeah. <laughs> now but yeah, before we can, it, we've all heard that one. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> before well, we get too far in the conversation, I do want to pose one more question. We were kind of talking, you know, before we started recording and I found it really interesting that you both had kind of your own favorite aspects of falconry. I think that's, what's so interesting about, you know, hunting and falconry is, is you can really hone in on a specific aspect of that, you know, entire umbrella for lack of a better term and, and really focus and enjoy that one specific aspect even though you're still kind of fulfilling the, the totality of this so can we just kind of go back and forth and quickly just kind of discuss your kind of favorite part of this entire process okay so for me um it's new birds i i've tried to interview which is keep a bird over the summer and then fly it again the second year I've tried to do that several times and it just is not my thing um I like the training aspect of it as much as the hunting. So I've had, gosh, I've been doing this for 13 years and I think I've had 16 birds. <laughs> um, so that's, that's more my thing. I like bringing the bird out, getting it through its first winter um, and then letting it go in the fall and let it be what it is. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I have to really say, aside from the hunting piece of it, because we are a hunting organization, we are, that's the main goal is to pursue and catch game. Um, I actually really love the educational piece. So it's really glad, I'm really happy that you all are involved in the education piece. Um, I love helping new apprentices, um, although selective, <laughs> and we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, I do love that piece of it. And one of the other things is, is I love understanding and learning new species, working with new species. Um, it never gets boring when you do that, just like the new bird training, it never gets boring. So there's always something different you can work with um, or new techniques you can try that are being developed even to this day. So that's one of my things. It's, it's very evolving, even though it is a, a historical sport. Very cool. Yeah, it's cool to see the history and modern day technology come together. And I'm glad you pointed out the like the difficulty and, and how selective you are in, in choosing an apprentice, uh, because w we talk about like kind of this hierarchy of um, how much preparedness do you need to do different kinds of hunting, right? Like to go squirrel hunting, almost nothing. Right now, I could call Dan and say, hey, Dan, let's go squirrel hunting. We could be out the door in 30 minutes. Uh, you know, with our shotguns and we can be squirrel hunting, right? Deer hunting, a little bit more, you know, uh, some of the stuff like raccoon hunting with hounds, a little bit more because you're into the training of the hounds and you need the technology for the dogs. And so falconry is on the high end of that spectrum. So it's obviously not something for everybody. You've got to have, I mean, you have a whole uh, room dedicated for your, your birds, right? So it's oh. like... Yes. You're More house shopping that. with your birds in mind. <laughs> it's um, vacations become dedicated to the sport as well. You know, if you, you've got to have family buy-in also, I mean, you've got to build a special muse. It has to be regulated. 
And then those Maui trips tend to not be so exciting anymore because you'd rather go to Kansas and look for sage grouse. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you're, it's a lifestyle more so than a hobby. Um, if you look around the homes of all the falconers that I know, there's art. All the art that you have in your home <laughs> becomes falconry or bird related. Your community starts to identify that you are the bird person. So you become the expert in, in your field, in your area. So it, that's why we're selective is because we want to make sure that the people we choose to bring into the sport represent the sport and the ethical values that we follow, uh, the regulations, because it is a small community. Word travels fast. There is no secret <laughs> to anything that you're doing. So it is really important that you stay on task and, and within regulations because you'll ruin the name for everybody else if you don't. So we're super selective about that. So, and, and you'll see the involvement here as we move forward as to what you have to do in order to become a falconer. So, so, and it's even at the higher end of things. So even something simple, probably the easy, the most simple one would be an American Kestrel. Um, it's still, you still have to devote almost nine months of time before you even start. You have to have housing, you have to have a plan, you have to have a vet, you have to figure out all of those things. And then when you get into falcons, like uh, peregrine falcons or jeer falcons, now you have to get all kinds of other equipment. You know, most of the falconers that have falcons are, are flying with GPS. Um, and that's a considerable investment. Mm -hmm. Most of them use drones, another considerable uh -huh. investment. So... Yeah, the technology has moved a long way in the past couple decades. I mean, it hasn't been that long uh, that a GPS uh, thing could be small enough to be put on something that size. So, um, yeah. I, so, how much do you know? How much do those run? Like, I'd imagine that's that's like five five grand easy. Pretty much, yeah, yeah. 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 To, uh, traditional telemetry is something that's still yeah. wild, widely used. And you could probably get that for all in transmitter and receiver about six to seven hundred dollars. The GPS stuff, um, now you're looking at to make sure you have the technology or the phone platform that'll run it, number one. Sure. So you got it for that. Um, but you also are looking at yeah, I would say about five thousand dollars for mm -hmm. something that'll work the way you want it to. So and then you have housing, you have to consider housing, right? But you can't yeah. A hawk in your garage so you have to build a facility that will house them through the winter right right so and that investment could be converting something that you already have making it fit the regulations or you can build new so that really could be anywhere from a couple hundred dollars depending on where you're at all the way up to the muse mahal is what we call it which could be ten thousand dollars <laughs> i like that the muse mahal <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that's one of those terms. So basically, a <laughs> mew or a muse is what we call the housing for the falconry birds. Right. Right. And that's uh, the big thing. So when when you become and you're interested in falconry, some of the things that you want to do is get your terminologies down. Um, if you're to walk up to a potential sponsor and say, oh, look at the claws on that falcon. <laughs> you're going to seem uneducated. So yeah. there's, there's, oh my gosh, I can't even, the variety of books that are out there, grab them, read them, because all those terms are in there. Much better off walking up to a potential sponsor saying, what beautiful talons your bird has, because <laughs> you know? that's the terms that we use. So that is, a, I would say that's probably one of the huge identifiers when we're selecting somebody for the apprenticeship is making sure their terminology is on point with where that where it should be just through reading and the learning and, and, and i guess that just really highlights the amount of research they've done prior to this step it's not you know necessarily that they know how to spell that word it's it just shows that level of of dedication that they've already done you know some preliminary research i guess right absolutely and, and it's important and it's really no different than than hunting deer right. or squirrels because well we can't hunt we do hunt squirrels with fox as well but um you, you have to learn the prey. Yeah. You, if you don't learn the prey, then you have very little success. Sure. So, and then you also have to learn the bird. Yeah. So it's multi multifaceted, you know, 
you're yeah. learning two basically two different things because the bird becomes your the replaces the shotgun basically yeah. you know it does so not only are you the hunter but you're also watching a hunter um it's you get very primitive minded when you're hunting i mean i know you guys know that when you're sitting there and, and mm -hmm. looking at what you want That's to most hunt. of the beauty of it right there it is i call <laughs> it my church <laughs> i like that yeah you know, it's uh it, it brings you home to to those primitive instincts that we have and then you get to work with this bird that has instincts as well that you can't teach it you know it's it's very difficult to take a captive bred bird and teach it what wild birds will know which we'll get into to how to get those things in, in a little while here but and it, yeah. to, just to put it in perspective you brought up the shotgun um so it's kind of like if your shotgun had a personality and idiosyncrasies. <laughs> if you had to figure out what your shotgun was going to feel like that day every time you went out, that's what we deal with. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Whether I'm or not it wants to either. grab you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, as far as GLFA, Great Lakes Falconers Association.org is the website for that. There's a plethora of information on there, although a simple site, a beautiful site. Um, GLFA has been around for over 50 years, so it is not a new club, although it's had its ups and downs throughout those years, just based on regulations and things like that. We wanted to become involved with GLFA so that we could continue the growth, um, and to see new people come in and carry it on further when we are no more, we'd love to see that continue going. Our region is Illinois based, so from Southern tip to Northern tip. But we also have many, many um, outside members. So Wisconsin, Michigan, most of our Great Lakes area will want to come in there. Um, as a member, you get to come and join in to the meets that we have where we all gather and hunt as a group um, and network and have a good time and all those those lovely things. Share our, our lives, our hunting lives. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the beauty of having a club that community plus if there are issues um let's say with um some laws that are going to try and be passed that might stifle the success of falconry we can come together as a group and come up with a better plan and propose that plan as a collective unit so that's one reason why having a club is a good idea um, we are also glfa is also a member and personally we are members of nafa the North American Falconers Association. And that is a national group, international actually. Yep. They have many international members. Also a wonderful group to be a part of every year. They have a very large meet that they hold and you'll have upwards of two, three, 400, depending on, you know, COVID or <laughs> avian yeah. things like that, environmental stuff. But it's, a, it's an also nice way to make sure Again, we're working collectively to keep the sport up and running. So, they, is there a magazine, like a quarterly publication? Yes. Once you become a member, we'll, it's called The Gauntlet, and that goes out to all of our members three to four times a year. Yeah. Cool. So, and, that, and that's kind of one of the things that, that I think brought Bonnie and I to becoming officers. I, I'm a director. Um, is they were the group, the the club was having trouble with the transition with social media and, and how all communications have changed. Um, and so I'm a trainer by profession and we're kind of bringing that perspective to things so that we can hopefully embrace a new generation of falconers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to give a shout out to, to the other members of the, um, board because they are also on board with it. The newsletters and gauntlets have never looked so good. <laughs> the <laughs> website is great. Um, so we've got a lot of dedicated people and we don't get paid. <laughs> There's no payment. So it is truly a work of love or the work yeah. of passion in order to get this going and continue having it going. And I, I really like the, that you highlighted, you know, these meets and these different I guess, for lack of a better term, social activities that kind of revolve around falconry, because, you know, just from my cursory, you know, discussions with you and, and some other people, it seems like it's a very tight knit community and you cannot 
I mean, obviously, even outside of the apprentice program, you can't do it yourself. You have to have people to bounce these ideas off of. You may need a hand with, you know, assisting. And, and so having these, you know, basically social networks where you're, you know, all coming together, I think is a fantastic idea. I definitely see the value in that. A huge value in that. If you're struggling with the species and you know somebody has been flying that species for 10 years, why wouldn't you reach out to that first sure. person assistance on what to do next? Um, or if you don't have plentiful game in your area for the species that you have, maybe you can use your community to go down and borrow some of their fields for a little while. You know, we're not, most of us are not in it to take our max head of game every day because you decimate your fields that way. We are in it to see the pursuit, the catch, <laughs> the eating of the game. So it isn't so much that we want as much yield as we can as just being a part of that. Right. And so we are usually, everybody's pretty open about sharing their field. But the caveat to that is, is if you're going to be in my field, I'm going to go see your bird fly while you're in my field. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but that just brings that community tighter together. And again, that's the reason why it is difficult to find a sponsor because it is a pretty tight knit community. Sure. Um, and, and there are instances where it doesn't work out that sponsor apprentice relationship and it, it'll tire you out. It's an investment. So you really do have to show up, ask <clears throat> questions. Um, and in previous days, like when he was looking for a sponsor, we called it the Gaboon. So he would have to clean the muse and make equipment and do things that maybe we didn't want to do. Yep. <laughs> to show the dedication to the sport and he learned while he was doing it right right um, which is the big thing and, and i had to do it too i just didn't know i was a gaboon i was just a kid <laughs> <laughs> you know growing up and hey go take out hawk food hey go get yeah. that hey go do that and you just do it so that's something that is a little bit lost right now but i do see it making a comeback um the talent in the community is amazing with making homemade equipment, with making leatherworking, tooling, um, braiding equipment, just welding, welding perches. There's so much talent involved in this. So again, you can spend as much as you want or you can use your talents yeah. to keep your costs down and build it yourself. Now, one thing you, you kind of brought up, you know, this this term, you know, your field, I assume a lot of that's private land access that, that you, is that pretty easy to come across? You know, because we obviously, in terms of, you know, deer, waterfowl, it's difficult. It, I was just kind of curious if that same trend, or if you can, you know, use the bird a little bit to, hey, you can yes. come watch. Yeah. <laughs> you show up with a hawk on your fist, generally people will at least listen to you. Yeah. Sure, sure. It's not a cold call. Yeah. <laughs> so much as it is with you, with you guys with waterfowl and deer um and, and it's about education too so because we're taking birds from the wild i mean these are considered wild birds mm -hmm. all the time and and that can give people kind of a negative view of what we do um 70 percent or more of the hawks that are hatched in june will die in their first winter um, by us taking one of those hawks, because we can only take first year birds, by us taking one of those birds, we're teaching it to hunt the most difficult prey that it is, that it can hunt, and that's rabbit, because they're about the same size or even rabbits are a little bit bigger. And, and one of the questions that comes up about is about choice. So do the birds choose to come to you? Yes, because we free fly them when we're hunting, and mm -hmm. they have every opportunity to fly away. But they don't. And I'm sure that happens on occasion. Yeah. It does. It happened with my first bird. And you know what? <laughs> At first it was, I was devastated. And then it changed my perspective because then I was like, okay, the worst thing that can happen is this bird can fly, fly away. So I began to fly my birds much freer, let them be themselves. I had one bird that wouldn't catch a rabbit in the open field. It would have to herd it into a copse of trees. Really? In order to catch it. Huh the hardest way possible that bird that's how that bird caught every rabbit so you just have to let them be them yeah so the field thing is yeah our fields we we do take ownership although most of the time they're not ours oh if sure, sure. You know, <laughs> if you discover it and you've done the work to create the relationship with the landowner um it's considered your field so 
you are to invite people to your field. You can invite people to your fields. Um, but again, we go back to making sure we leave it better than we found it, taking care of the land, all of those ethical things as falconers too. And one of the things we haven't hit yet, which might excite some people is, is because we're not using a firearm of any sort, we do get to use inner city or city um, fields. Industrial parks. Industrial parks are really, really rich with rabbits. So we have opportunities to hunt in places that maybe people with a firearm cannot um, just because of laws. But we also have some other dangers to worry about too, which would be your power lines and your, your things like that. So yeah. roads, cars, birds get hit by cars constantly. So there's a lot of figuring out what is a good field and what is not a good field, even in that city environment. Um, but that's usually where we find mm -hmm. rabbits. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it's you brought that up. Though. That's one of the my favorite uh, aspects about it is, yeah, that access, because that's one of the biggest things in Illinois. So many people, they want to hunt, but it, they have such trouble finding access, especially in the Chicago region. And it's not because the game's not there. Like you said, there's tons of places where there's rabbits and, and squirrels and, and even deer and stuff like that. But uh, getting access to it is just impossible with a firearm. But change up your methods a little bit. Like you said, Tim, come up with a, a hawk on your wrist and people listen. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, when you said that, I was thinking, yeah, that's true. If somebody ever comes up to me with a bird on them anywhere, I'm, I'm going to listen, you know, that <laughs> might be a wizard or something. I'm mad. <laughs> well, and that's why we don't have the birds out yet. Cause nobody will listen to us as soon as they come out. So <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it, it is hard in Illinois specifically. I think it's difficult just because um, we don't have open fields like that. Now we do have access to some of the hunting grounds, the, the state hunting grounds and things like that. But rare, rare occasions are, is it plentiful for the birds that we fly? So there might be more predation there, natural predation. So that's why we kind of look at some of those little industrial park areas and they're popping because there's just True. not as much of that natural predation in there. And we have to, all our hunting season, season coincides with deer hunting season. So yeah, on good. firearm weekends, we have to wear orange. Yeah. Um, we can't be in the same field as a deer hunter. So even some of the, the state facilities, like there's one here in Marseilles, we can't use that because it's being used by deer hunters. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we have to, to consider and educate landowners about is, hey, if you've told people that they can come and deer hunt here, we can't be here when they're here yeah. because they'll ruin our hunt and we'll ruin their hunt and sure. everybody's just going to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So usually in that case, what we'll do is take turns because if it's weekends, we can go during the week, maybe in that field. So there's always a compromise there. And of course, we'll never touch somebody else's equipment. You might see us on your trail cam, yeah. but that's about it. That'd be a good trail cam picture. <laughs> um, there's been a few, you know, sometimes you don't know they're there and you have to go to the bathroom. And... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Been there. <laughs> You bought it. <laughs> I was thinking just, just walking by, you know, with the bird, with there's the probably hawk, yeah. been some conversation pieces at the bar. You know, somebody's like, oh, I got a picture of a bobcat. And so, well, look what I got. <laughs> you know? oh, People just carrying birds through the woods. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> well, and we've had in industrial parks, because we use sticks to kind of beat the brush to get the rabbits to flush. Okay. So um, We've had the police called on us because oh. we're hunting hawks, not hunting with hawks. We're hunting hawks because they see the stick and they assume that it's like maybe a firearm and we're pointing it and the bird's flying around and it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's amazing the, the encounters that we have. I can imagine. My yeah. first rabbit, there were, uh, there was a county sheriff, two different city police and a conservation police officer all showed wow. up because people called. Which is good. You know, that's fine. We're so, not doing anything wrong. So. Right, right. All of our paperwork, hunting license, everything was good. They were just like, oh, okay, sorry, we're out. Can I yeah. see your bird? <laughs> <laughs> gonna no. say, they, they probably all remember your first rabbit just as much as you do. Yes. You know, that's the first one that they seen like that too, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're big advocates for our officers. Um, if they're they're just doing their job yep. when they come out and check on us, and and I appreciate that. So we pretty much know them by name <laughs> um, because they do. They are a big part of our success, and we love what they do. So throwing that out there. 
Um, so if you want to get into falconry, you have to at least be 14 years or older. Um, if you start off at 14, you have to be at least 18 before you can be upgraded to a general. So you go from an apprentice falconer to a general falconer. Five and years as a general. Five years as a general falconer, and then you become a master falconer, and whatever that means. <laughs> you're allowed in, in to what have state? different birds at different levels, right? In the past, it used to be more strict that way, but yes, apprentices traditionally, um, if you're taking a wild bird, you're looking at a kestrel, American kestrel, or you're looking at a red-tailed hawk. Um, now some of those regulations have yeah. changed where you can purchase. You could purchase hybrids. Hybrid? Or um, I believe that you you can purchase um, Harris's hawks. Mm -hmm. So, but, and the Peregrine is still regulated. We can only, as a community, the falconry community can only take two Peregrine falcons, trap two Peregrine falcons a year. Wild. And it's a lottery, so you don't even know if you're going to uh, have, have that opportunity. Um, so, but uh, red tail hawks, kestrels, those are generally your starter birds. Um, within the regulations, it says that you can use a great horned owl, but nobody's really ever figured that out very easily. It's just a different time. You, I think you'd have to have night vision goggles and hunt yeah, clients. I don't even know, but <laughs> yeah. it is allowed. It is allowed, but yeah, again, what are, how much are you going to see? So, <laughs> and that's kind of the sponsor's job to kind of yeah. keep those expectations realistic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this guy comes in with major expectations. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's the, the major distinctions between somebody at the general stage and the, the master? Is our masters the only ones who can act as, you know, that, that sponsor or can a general too? So a general that's been a general for three years, in other words, they would have five years in falconry, can be a sponsor. Um, we try, and as a community, I think we try and keep it to master falconers just sure, because we sure. have a little bit more experience. Um, but you can. The difference is, is there's different kinds of birds. So you have to be a master falconer in order to trap and fly a peregrine falcon. Um, right no one else can do that and then it's birds so as masters bonnie and i can have five birds of uh, each oh, okay which is a lot which is a lot. We That's a lot a <laughs> lot and no. as a general you can have two and as apprentice you can only have one, one. got it mm -hmm. so yes i'm just listening to all this I, if somebody's interested in falconry really what they need to do is join the Great Lakes Falconry Association for a year or two and just observe and make sure because it's such it's such a commitment. You need to nobody limps into falconry, right? I mean, you have to really decide that it's for you before you jump in. So you should almost be a member for a year or two before you even start looking for a sponsor, I feel like. And and realistically, that's really the only way you're gonna find a sponsor. Yeah. Um, because we are not out there very much so we get together as falconers in, within group events so that's one place that you know that you're going to be able to find them um and it is a commitment i mean you're you have to be together for two years and longer you know mm -hmm. so you have to make sure that personalities mesh you ha there's a whole different aspect to everything sure. um mm -hmm. so the best way is yes become a member of glfa um come to our meets because our meets are only for members only and to get to know people and talk to people and help people and ask questions and get yourself out there. And then it's best if you don't necessarily ask, you wait until that offer comes. But I know sometimes that doesn't, you have to be too patient for that. So everybody there knows that someone joined the club because they want to be an apprentice. So when the time is right, most of falconers will offer. Yeah, and I think the really big thing is, is when somebody offers, hey, you wanna come out in the field and fly with my bird, go. That's how you build the relationship. You go out hawking is what we call it um, with those people. And that's where you learn each other. And <laughs> everybody by nature in falconry is an educator. So 
it, we, even when you're out in the field, is it, it isn't as simple as you're just going to go watch the bird fight. No, you're going to get instructed <laughs> how to walk the field, where to hit, what we're looking for, um, how to even recognize that there is, let's say, a rabbit moving. There's specific things that we do. <laughs> um, and public relations is huge. huge. Last year, I trapped a bird. She was maybe two hours off the trap and on my fist and someone walked up and wanted to know what I was doing. You can't just push them away. Right. right. So, because then they have this idea that you're doing something nefarious and then the police come and it gets more complicated. <laughs> yeah. So it's just easier to educate them when you encounter them. So even at the most inopportune times. And if you don't know, don't make it up. <laughs> That's the big thing. I like that. Me. Yeah. <laughs> ask questions or I don't know, I'll get back to you is always good. Um, so we've got the joining the club as a pathway. We've got going out and attending events and networking that way. Um, it does happen very naturally if you're seeking the sponsor. Um, read books. We talked about that a little bit. Get that library started. You don't have to spend a million dollars. You don't have to read it cover to cover. Just get through it, look at it, get your terms together. So you can have educated questions for your sponsor is a big thing. Um, and GLFA also, we provide a um, seminar, a one day seminar once a year. Um, there is a charge for that, but you can register for that. And then that gets more into it. That's, I think we do seven hours. It's a long day. Okay. Um, and it's the introduction. We get into a little bit of the training that you get to touch and feel the equipment. Um, so you know what you're getting into. We even make some equipment. We have some crafts, <laughs> our nice. crafts that we do. So we yeah, might even extend that into better. an advanced training where we get into more of the, maybe even a bird handling and more training technique. Because it's important to us, if your bird looks good, is feather perfect, it is, it is a direct reflect of you as a handler and as a caregiver. So we want to make sure that that is what we're breeding within the club and within the Falconry community as well. So um, also your sponsor's job to help you through that, but it's a kickstart. If you can't make it to the workshops, then you're not really interested. Sure. So it's that beginning stage of, did you dedicate time to even do that? So yeah. there's there's always those little tests. Sorry, guys. <laughs> right. And the likelihood of think, waking up one morning and, hey, I'm going to be a falconer yeah. and have that happen within the next month is is not realistic. It, yeah. It's literally going to take a year or two. Yeah. Um, it makes sense to to vet the because you don't want to, you know, everybody that watches Harry Potter and says, oh, I want a snowy owl, you know, for one day, then they think they're going to become a falconer and just be walking around with a pet snowy owl in their head or something. I, you got to weed those folks out. And so the only way to do that is with time and, and commitment. So mm -hmm. um, right. now that one event you were talking about, is that open uh, to non-members then? The um, seven hour event? What we're looking at doing with that one is um, the membership is $25 for an oh. individual membership. So I believe what we wanted to do was charge non-members and then have it open to members. Um, last year was the first time that we did it and we did not charge for it. Um, we're looking because of materials and stuff like that, that we need to be able to rent the hall space. We're looking at doing some sort of charge this year just to compensate the club back for that cost, but it won't be um, a large amount. Sure. We're not looking to make money on the deal, just break even. Sure. So that'll be coming out on the website and the Facebook page when we get the details on that. So we're probably looking at maybe a $25 fee just to compensate. And there's a limited number of seats. There is. So um, if you know you're going to go, then you go. Because, yeah, when it yeah, opens, get your ticket. Yeah, people away. And then if you don't show those other people don't get to have it. So please make sure it goes on the calendar if that's what you decide you want to do that day. Let's be uh, watching the website for that soon. I know we'll be we'll be watching because we might try to make that one. That sounds pretty pretty fun. Seven hours of getting to learn all your secrets. Uh, I'll take that. No, for not, all. not all. Not all. It's a deal. <laughs> we got to leave them. something for the sponsors to do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some of them. Um, and then, you know, so you've got... You're becoming the Falconers. You've got your sponsor, let's say. Now you need to build your muse. Um, again, this all takes anywhere between 16 months and two years to get done just because of time. Now, you know, I don't know about you, but it can take some good time to put up a good facility. 
So you want to make sure you get quality items, or if you're doing it on the cheap, you have to gather the items. Um, we have an apprentice right now. He's just a gem. He's 16 years old and he gathered and begged and pleaded for materials because he doesn't have a job. And he put up an amazing view cool. and did a really great job. So um, then after you get it built, you actually have to have it inspected. And that inspection, you'll get regulations when you become a part of the GLFA and it'll tell you what the regulations are on that view. Those regulations are identical to what the inspector is looking for. And we're looking at a DNR officer to come out and inspect the news afterwards. Um, and you can also get a falconry packet from the state of Illinois. Yeah. And there's information about GLFA in there. Correct. Um, as well as all of the requirements. Yeah, all of that stuff. So, so and actually before you start building a news, you have to pass a test. Yeah, well, yeah. There's a written test and the correct score is 80%. Okay. I think it's 100 questions, isn't it? Yeah. Or is it 110? Uh, I don't remember. Uh, 100 questions or a little bit more. The test itself <laughs> is aged. <laughs> I will tell you that right now there's medical questions on there that we wouldn't use that type of medication today because of the technology advancements, medical advancements, but it is still on the test. As a collective group, we are trying to come together to give the state more options so that they're a little bit more updated. But it's not just about falconry. It's about bird migrations, bird habits, identifying birds, um, birds that we don't even really use in falconry on a regular basis. So a well-rounded test, that's why those books are important and your sponsor is important. Um, because yeah, and so just uh, talking about the test, you, are there any specific book recommendations that you all have? I mean, do you have a specific field guide that you like or? Mm -hmm. Yes. In the packet that you get from the state, there's books that they almost require you to have or read or know about. In fact, that question is on the test, even about what books, books. are good. Yes. Oh. So, <laughs> so and that and that's something sponsors will, will work with you on because they everybody has their own opinion on what's best and it's gonna coincide with the way that they do things. Yeah. So not everybody does everything the same way and not every way is the wrong way or the right way. So there's there's a lot of personal expression in Falcon. Mm -hmm. So we can't give you a name because it just depends. Um, so I think we just started going through our collective books and I, we have about 500 books on falconry. Wow. And no, I have not read them all. No. Some of them are decorated. Library. Yeah, yeah. It, it's crazy because there's book collectors out there who pay mint for some of this stuff. Yeah. Because it is historical. It's a historical. So we got one in Latin. I don't even know. I can't even read oh, it. Oh, that's cool. French. <laughs> Just a couple French, French ones. French ones, yeah. Um, so yeah, the book thing, the test thing, make sure you pass that test. I think you can take it up to three times in one year. Uh, if you don't make it the first time, relax. At least you know what's on it now. Take it again in a month. And is it the same one? Maybe. <laughs> 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 uh, they may have two versions they might. i I'm don't know sure. again the glfa that's one of the things that we're doing is we're working with the department of natural resources to come up with a more representative sure. Sure. Okay. Well. now the test is just something that people are taking in the beginning right like you all don't have to be tested periodically now that you're masters, right? No. Correct. No, if you change over state lines and let's say you move, if we wanted to move to Colorado, we would have to transfer our falconry license to Colorado. It depends on what that state's state. regulation is on whether or not you need to retest in, let's say, Colorado. Most of them will grandfather you in depending on how long you've been in it, but um, it's all state by state now. It used to be federally run, but uh, that it didn't go smoothly. So they brought it down to the state level for everybody to take care of. Um, so, and to put things into perspective, there is less than 500 falconers in Illinois. Oh yeah. So we don't have a very high priority on the Department of Natural Resources list of things to do <laughs> no. because it just doesn't affect enough people for them to be concerned about it. Yeah, except for when they're, you know, inspecting and things like that. Right. I mean, they're really good about that. The high, most highly regulated hunting sport out there, and with good good reason. Yeah. We're yeah. working with wild animals. We yeah. should have a higher level of expectation. 
So now are those uh, MUSE inspections, does that have to be conducted annually too? No. No. Okay. No. So once, if you move and build a new facility, then it has to be inspected at the, as the new one. Okay. Once you've had your initial inspection, as long as you remain at that location with your birds, you don't have to have be inspected cool. again. But you also have to remember too that you have to keep up everything and make sure that it's maintained. Right. Uh, crazy things can happen. Someone could drive by and say, hey, they got this cage or whatever the, it may look like to them and call the Department of Natural Resources. And if there's a call on you, then the conservation police are required to follow up on that call. So if your stuff's not right, you're going to lose out in the end. So you have sure. to maintain your facility. Yeah. And they can do spot inspections just like with anybody else. Just mm -hmm. stop by. You don't even have to be home. They can look in and peer in and they don't even have to tell you they were there. So realistically, just keep your stuff up to par and clean, you know, as clean as you can, especially in that frigid weather <laughs> that you have. But um, yeah, that's the key is just maintaining it. And most of the conservation policemen are are well educated as far as falconry goes. So if if your muse is a little bit dirty during the winter time, they understand that you, the only way to clean it is with water, and you can't use water when it's right. below zero. Yeah. But you can scrape up the mute, right? Which is another name so, for poop. poop. <laughs> Terms. Terms. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And then the other thing is hunter safety. Um, I did want to bring up that you do have to take your hunter safety course. It is a hunting sport. So you still have to take that. I think I was uh, one of the few because yeah, I was under 14. And now I believe it's law that anybody has to do it. Is that the case? I, yes, I believe so. Well, I'm old. So they would never require that of me because I'm <laughs> old <Please> grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, everybody's required to do it now, I believe. Yeah, I believe that is. And you know, it's a good idea anyway. Yeah. There's safety things that I would have never even thought of until I took that course. So. And you all probably know that better than I, we do. Yeah. Does everyone have to do a hunter safety course? Yeah, if you're born on or after January 1st, 1980, you are That's required right. to take it. If you're before that, you're like you, Tim, grandfathered in. Okay. There are apprentice options that people can buy before getting that, but, you know, it's limited. So to get... It's just better for people to, to do it. Take yeah. it yeah. I just swapped the interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So if everything goes well, you've acquired your sponsor, you've acquired your muse is all set up, you've got, you know, everything is ready to go. What is your next step? And that's where your sponsor really comes into play because now we're going to acquire the bird which also includes more permits, <laughs> more approval. Um, each one of the birds that we have that is wild trap will have a black band on it that is given to you, or basically, I think it's 35 bucks, 50, $50 for, for trapping permit. the trapping permit or acquisition permit that comes with that band. You must have that band on the bird while in your facility at all times because that identifies that bird specifically. Um, as a wild caught bird. As a wild caught bird. Now, if you have a purchase bird, purchase bird that was bred in captivity, they're going to have a different kind of band. A solid it's going to be a solid band. seamless metal band. Right. So that helps identify on a quick glance whether or not it was a wild bird or a bred in captivity bird. Um, and that's all regulated and tracked by the state as well. Um, so now we have to acquire our bird. You are going to lean heavily on your sponsor and your sponsor's network to do that. There's many different ways of doing it, as simple as throwing out a safe trap outside your car door with the bird on a pole. And, you know, we do use live bait because dead bait does not work. Right. These are, you know, hunters, so they want live. And then they'll come down on that. There's other ways where we do something called ridge trapping or bow trapping, bow net trapping. And there's, again, live bait, you jiggle it. You j it's kind of like jigging min minnows. <laughs> you just keep jigging it and you'll catch them on a migration route, hungry and they're opportunists. So they'll come in if they think that there's a hurt animal there, it's an easy catch, quick meal. And then you capture them there. And what are you using for bait? Um, it depends on the species. 
number one, and so does the trap. So does the, the, the item that you use. But we can use anything from a gerbil, a mouse, to starlings, sparrows, uh, pigeons. pigeons. Okay. We traditionally use a lot of pigeon. Um, not many people are too concerned. There's plentiful amounts sure, of pigeon sure. out there. But the idea, hopefully, is to not have the bait animal perish during the trapping situation. Oh, okay. That's the idea. In some cases, it does happen. Mm -hmm. that they come in very strong. And that is a bird you want to keep. <laughs> <laughs> they are very dedicated to catching that game. So, and that's one of the things that we talk about during the education seminar that we'll have annually is we go into a little bit more detail on trapping. And yeah. That's uh -huh. what yeah, we don't like to give that away too much. We don't want anybody going rogue. Uh, so. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, but it's a, a really neat thing. We call it sky fishing because basically that's what you're doing. You can't see them coming in a lot of times and then they bushwhack you just and then they're there. Huh. So I find it to be extremely enjoyable. Um, and then let's see, what do we got? Road trapping, ridge trapping, purchasing. You can purchase. Um, there's many sites out there. Just be sure to follow all your rules and regulations when you decide, if you decide you're going to purchase a bird. Uh, you can't just willy-nilly. Make sure they have paperwork um, because you can get in a lot of trouble. And yeah, I guess, especially if it's coming from across state lines, you can get yeah. into some serious Especially trouble. now, there's some issues with uh, some of the avian flu and stuff like that yeah. going on. So there's some quarantine stuff. I, just even to go into Wisconsin, they have we have to get a health certificate just across the border. Wow. So it's a little bit more restrictive just because we have a live animal that we're working with. Um, you know, I just want to see some birds. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> is that okay. the jingle bells that we've been hearing in the background? Yes, it is. Oh, actually, I thought so. I thought so. <laughs> we'll get into a little bit of that too because they've got some equipment on that we can point out so oh, cool. a little intro on that they're gonna we're gonna do one at a time so i'll be right back so and just while she's gone the the bells are actually a way that we can locate our birds so so as and, opposed to a gps system that's kind well, of well yeah that's like the old school gps sure. system is that you can hear and it gives you a little bit of awareness where the birds are so these birds are trained and they're used to coming to you and they may come to you when your back is turned and ah. they have pointies on their feet and that can go through most coats so you want to make sure that you know where your bird is and if they sure. get behind you the bells help with that sure so. yeah or even in the brush pile i know when i went out with my brother-in-law and uh, his red tail went down on a rabbit couldn't see it anywhere, but we could hear the little bell jingling, so we knew we knew what what pile it was in. But without that, we would have had no clue. Mm -hmm. All right. So what we have here is a peregrine falcon, and she is an adult bird. I want to say she is three years old now, and she is one of the first wild trap peregrine falcons uh, in Illinois since they allowed us to do the lottery system. One of the reasons why they would not allow us to do it is because there was a product out there called DDT um, in the past that was put out to get rid of flock birds um, on a lot of these refineries and things like that. Unfortunately, it didn't just affect the flock bird population, it affected anything that preyed on the flock bird population. So what happened was is the wild peregrines um, when they ingested the flocks, let's say starling, um, the poison got into them as well and it thinned the eggs that they were laying when they were in their breeding stages and it would crush the eggs when they just went to sit on them and brood them. So we lost a lot of population with many, many prey birds yeah, or predator birds, excuse me, eagles, falcons, hawks. Um, so it affected a lot of things, falconry and falconers. Were dedicated to bringing them back obviously so there were many many falconers out there who actually uh, donated their birds for part of a breeding project and then oh, wow. bred them and released them back into the wild to bring the population back up that's why we see so many in chicago right now um, yeah and they love those industri industrial areas for sure oh yeah plenty yeah. of food out there too so what we have on our head here because we're going to talk about her equipment a little bit is called a hood 
Um, and what that does is it actually covers her eyes, but it doesn't touch her eyes. It just covers her eyes. It still allows her to breathe out of her nair or her nose and full access to her mouth. That actually reduces stress. And you'll see once I pull the hood off, I'm not her normal handler. This is my father's bird. So we're utilizing her because she, she's the only falcon we have. Um, and I wanted to show you, but so when I take her hood off, you'll see that she might do what they call bait, which is to try and fly away and then she'll come back to the perch. So hopefully she'll behave. You ready to see your face? Yeah. All right, I'm coming in. And this is an extremely traditional thing. There's specific blocks that are used to make them. It's all out of kip leather. Yeah, there she is. And now she has hat head. So she is used for hunting um, pheasants, ducks. Oops, that's a mute. <laughs> <laughs> pheasants hut uh ducks feathered game is what we're looking for for her so she'll need those wide open spaces her particular flight style is going to be off of a soar so you'll see her circling above usually a dog um and then just like traditional pheasant hunting mm -hmm. the dog will point blush the dog and the bird will actually come down from a stoop and knock the pheasant or the duck down and then come back around and dispatch. So approximately how high when she's up soaring, you know, and the dog's work in the field, how high does she like to, to soar? Well, before GPS, every falcon flew at 2000 feet in the air. After GPS, the average is probably 800, 800 feet in the air. Um, and that would be a good pitch. For her to to get they can be as low as 400 and be successful or as high as 10 10,000 feet um, so they can really be up there it's uh you have to have a lot of trust with these birds which in actuality that's what we build when we're working with these wild animals is trust because you can't see her when she's in the sky she becomes a speck or a dot or completely disappears um, so you have to trust that she's still above you and in position to be able to go after the game. Oh yeah, and so from the soar, <clears throat> whatever it is, 800 feet, 1,000, what speed on the stoop might they reach? They can reach over 200 miles an hour. So they are actually the fastest, they're actually the fastest animal on the planet in that full stoop, in that dive. And it's really cool because with some of the cameras that we have now, you can see how their bodies elongate and how they use these. They things. almost contour it and they yeah, do. Like they a torpedo. Do. Yep. And there's even um, there's even some airplanes that have been designed after the design of the Falcon. So you can kind of look at those too and see some similarities with the wing tips and the wing shape. Each one of these birds is designed differently by nature. Her feathers are very sharp and hard and rigid, so that she can. Well, she's full of it today. Sharp and hard and rigid so that she can actually navigate in that type of a speed. She also has these bony pieces in her nostrils that allow her to be able to breathe. Because if you think about it, if we are oh. falling at a fast speed, um, we can't breathe. But because of those bony pieces in her nose, it breaks up the air so she can breathe well at, those, at that speed. What's that? Oh, oily tears. They've got that. They also have something called a mystitating membrane. So they have an eyelid and a membrane. So when they are flying at those speeds, the membrane comes down. They can still see through it and not have eye damage or dry out along with those tears. <laughs> Little built in uh, flight goggles, right? That's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. They're designed for that sort of thing. So as you now can how tell, old, how old is she? She's about three, I think. Is she three? Okay. Yeah. So she's three. Um, she does work with a dog and an old man, and they they work very well together. Different style, different game than a hawk would be. So you can definitely catch a pheasant with a hawk, but your style is different. Um, a lot of your seasoned falconers will end up going with a peregrine or some sort of hybrid jeer falcon. Your peregrine mix, something like that. 
Um, it's uh, it's but you need land, you need space in sure. order to buy these birds. This one would be hard to do in the inner city limit. Yeah, About how much does she weigh? Um, her flying weight is, I think, thirty-two ounces is where she's at. Um, for the larger birds like her, we weigh them in ounces, and that way we can. Uh, navigate their weight up and down a little bit more. She's probably sitting at about 38 ounces right now, which is why she's being a thinker. Uh, <laughs> when they're a little bit more hunt ready, they're a little bit more uh, relaxed, to be honest. But basically smaller than a pheasant or a duck. So oh, yeah. she's actually taking on prey larger than her body size. Absolutely. And the reason for that is the style in which she hunts them. So she'll knock them onto the ground and she actually has a tooth on her beak. Once they're on the ground, she will bind to them with her feet, which aren't all that strong. They're not. They do have sharp talons, but their feet are not squeezy. They're not going to squeeze the prey. She will reach in to the neck of the prey and use that tooth on her beak to break the neck. Oh. So stylistically, it's it's very efficient. So she doesn't have to fight them, even though they're when she takes down a cock pheasant that's way bigger than she is. So she really has to bind and then get in there and break that neck as quickly as possible in order to hang on. Yeah. Man, I bet she hits it with some energy when she hits it oh, yeah. fast. Gosh. Yep. <laughs> All right. Do you have any more questions about Eldora here? Thousands, but I think we could put her away for now. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. I'm going to sneak by over here and then we'll bring in the next one. Cool. Thanks for bringing her out. That's Not awesome. a problem. Beautiful. <laughs> so this is the red-tailed hawk. Her name's Tilly. She's two. Two. Yeah. Um, so we hunt rabbits with her pretty exclusively. Um, you can hunt squirrels with red-tailed hawks, but they fight back and can cause injuries. I just don't want to deal with that. Sure. So um, rabbits are the hardest. She's pretty big. Uh, for a red-tailed hawk, she flies somewhere around 55 ounces. Um, an average female would be about 10 ounces less, 45 ounces. Oh. Um, so, and in the bird of prey world, many people may not know this, but females are one third larger than males. So the larger the bird is, the more likely it is that that bird is a female. So... Females are, are more about business. Their role is to go out and hunt something larger so that they have to do it less. Where males, if they're smaller, they're faster, they're more agile, and, but they're going to go after smaller prey, mouses, mice, bulls, things like that. So, so is it pretty common for a lot of raptors for falconry to be female? Do, is that size I prefer, preferable? I prefer females. Okay. It really depends on the person. Um, the the nature of the tear soul, is, which would be the male, is a little bit calmer. Um, they're a little bit more subservient to you. Um, where the females, like Tim was saying, they're more business. Uh, now you can get, obviously, blends of both of them, too, just personality-wise. Sure. But it, traditionally speaking, um, so maybe a new falconer would like a tear soul. Um, versus a female because the females can be intimidating. I mean, she's very large talons and very large, mm -hmm. and very strong, and, and she's heavy, frankly. <laughs> I can tell, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely get heavy. a good arm workout after a while. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you haven't picked her up in a while, yeah. A couple yeah. couple gallons of milk will get you going <laughs> if you want to work out. But um, it just is a personality thing. We tend to like females for new apprentices because – it is a bit of a challenge. And if they can master that, then the tearsals will be no problem at all. They'll really understand that. Weight management too, tearsals tend to lose weight a little bit quicker. They might run into a crash situation if you don't manage it as well. So with the females, because they are larger, we have a larger window of error when it comes to weight management. So that's another reason why we like to kind of press for a female. Interesting. So tear souls are what we call males, basically means one third, one third smaller. Um, and when you're referring to a female, you're going to refer to them. So she is a red-tailed hawk, whereas 
the male would be a tiersel. So they get the name of the, the falcon. So she is a peregrine falcon and the male would be called a tiersel. Interesting. Many terms for that. <laughs> many, many terms, depending on species too. In Merlins, they're called a jack. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's a book in our collection that'll explain why. Glass <laughs> hawks are jerkins. Uh, no. no, it's a jerkin. Uh, uh, no, I'm not a glass on a jerk falcon. Jerk falcon, it's a jerkin. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of slang terms, but it all comes from somewhere. Sure. Um, and you'll notice she kind of has a little wedge head right now. The uh, she's got her hackles up. I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. Um, we use it all the time when you're angry. You got your hackles up. Sure. But. She's yeah. not angry. She's just got hat head. So <laughs> now one of the things that we kind of didn't talk about a little bit here was the whole process of the hunting in, in the fields and stuff with the falcon. You know, she comes from on high or on pitch with the red tails. There's two ways that you can really success. Well, three, but two that are commonly used. There's something called tree hawking. And then there's something called fist hawking. So fist talking is what you love fist, to do. Yes, fist talking is is your you have the bird just like this. She doesn't have all of this equipment on, so she just has two leather straps that you can kind of hang on to her a little bit with, so that you can control the release. Um, so you're walking through the field, the rabbit breaks out, you put her forward and let her go, and she'll fly and pursue it and hopefully catch it. Yeah. Um, it's a now, are you wearing? Are you putting on the hood at any part of that while you're kind of walking around, or is that mm -mm. strictly for? Okay. Yeah. No. The the I really don't. So with red tails, it's been my experience that the hood doesn't necessarily have to be on. I can do more things with her without her hooded because she can see that it's me. She's nosy, really. That's what uh, it's so if I put <laughs> the hood on her and tried to change the equipment out, she would probably just reach out out of in out of instinct because she felt something touch her sure um but yeah she doesn't really use the hood very much okay. so in that instance we are the ones putting pressure on the rabbits to move usually um they're sleeping during the day you know mm -hmm. they come out at night uh so we'll usually be stepping on their set or their hole that they're in in that area and getting them moving so there's high pressure and then re-release the bird. Hopefully the rabbit busts out within five feet of us. So the bird has a bit of an advantage with being very close to it. Another way, which is the, the most advantage is the tree hawking, which is the natural way that these birds will kill uh, or pursue and catch their game mm -hmm. because they're always going to be on the high. They're in a tree and then you become the dog. So you're going around poking into the areas and when the bird spots something, you might or might not see it depending on how far away it busts out from you. Um, but you will see the bird go down. They'll just basically come out of the tree, navigate, and then do a wing over. Or, or That's so cool. <laughs> it, that, that is why we do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it really isn't about filling your game bag. It's about, <laughs> right, and, right. and we've seen rabbits that, you know, a bird is pursuing it right on its tail. The rabbit's jump and it jumps straight up and the bird misses it. It turns around and runs away. We're just as happy with that rabbit as we are with the bird pursuing it. Um, because it's, it's incredible to see it. You don't get to see that. And I right. feel right. just talking about it. You don't see that TV doesn't give that to you. It's all staged and everything. But now, when, when you you're hunting, are you doing kind of one push per day are you able to you know harvest three or four rabbits out of one bird or is it that bird's probably exhausted now it's time to give it a break you can there's a technique that we use to trade off so they'll catch a rabbit and kill it and then we can trade them off onto something that won't fill them up and then maybe ah, okay. go for a second one um but you have to kind of take into consideration your fields sure so if there's not if there's not the prey base in your field to support taking two or three rabbits every mm -hmm. time go, then it's not a good idea to do it because that limits the time that you can use that and you don't want to decimate the field from prey. Right. So, and it also depends on how hard the winter is. So rabbits will die from freezing. Rabbits will die from coyotes and foxes. And the more severe the winter, the less prey there is at the end of the season. And you kind of have to consider that because if there's not enough for breeding, then that rabbit field is done. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, and that that also goes into it legally. We can we can hunt up into the rabbit 
breeding season. Um, a lot of us will quit well before that just to be sure we're not taking any pregnant rabbits. Or anything yeah, like that. yeah. It's not a good idea. I don't find it ethically responsible to do that. And you are cutting your field into, you know, into nothing. So mm -hmm. it goes back to that, considering the resources and keeping the land as good as we want it to. Yeah, we can go till March 31st, but we usually oh. don't go that late because, I mean, at that point you have, we don't have restrictions that tell us we can't take female rabbits or does. So, but if we take one that's pregnant, that's taking five or six rabbits oh, out of instead of just one. Yeah. So, right. and they reproduce so quickly when they're that young that you're, you know, right. you're taking back those next litter. Yeah, I, yep. I, I definitely see the validity of that. Yep, so. yep, and that that brings up a good point because we are working with wild wild animals. How do you tell them no? You can't take that mink. That, you know, yeah. well, how do you keep them from getting off, um, off off target? Off target species. It, it happens. We've had birds take skunks. God forbid. Oh. It's, <laughs> it's absolutely awful. Um, but what do you do in that situation? It's called the "let it lie" rule. So. It's understood that we are working and work with wild animals. They are going to catch anything that moves. And, and occasionally it includes a, a feral cat. It's terrible. Um, and it's a big fight. But in those situations, if it's off target game, we can allow the bird to eat on the meal, but we cannot okay. harvest any of it. We cannot yeah. take it with us. We can't even take a tail off of it. Nothing. It's got to stay there in its entirety. Um, and we have the same bag limits as as yeah. any rabbit hunter or any squirrel hunter. We can't take any more than that. Right. Sure. Right. That seems like an elegant rule for the you know the off target catches though. I never even that never even occurred to me to to think about that. That's really interesting. Well, it is. and it's it's the, it would be the same as let's say trapping something illegally. If we were to take that home and put it in our freezer, and someone were to find out about it, we could lose everything. Yeah. Sure. Yep, just being a part of that, making sure we're following the rules thing. Um, but it, I, I have to admit, it is exciting when they take something that is different. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't get to take it home. You know, you don't get to make a hat out of it or anything like that. There's none of that. There's a lot of rules when it comes to that as well. You can't, you can't have a bird of prey feather unless you have permits to have it. Um, you can't have skulls of them unless you have permits to have it because there was a lot of people in the past that would kill them just mm -hmm. for their feet, talons, feathers, um, skulls, because it's, it's the cool factor. Yeah. So we can't have mounts. Nope. No so mount. The only mount that we could have would be if we found an antique mount and a, same for everybody else. Um, the only reason that we can keep feathers is because if she were to break a feather, um, we can, we have a process called imping that we can put another feather in its place so that she always has maximum control because feathers equal control in the air. Right. Oh, so that's pretty cool. So if she were to lose a primary, you just hot yeah. glue another one in there and she's good to go? Pretty much. Pretty much yeah. <laughs> so it's not on how low it breaks because we still have to have some shaft right. to be able to, to put something in to hold it and then glue it, yeah. but yes. That's part of the husbandry. And that, again, is something that gets covered with your sponsor. And even in our workshop, we touched that a little bit, too. Um, we want to make sure that the birds are in full flight and they're at their best. So they can't they cannot fly equally if they're missing that primary. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and that actually brings me up to another point. We talked about the shaft. We know that the feathers shafts are hollow once that they've been fully grown in and they're out of blood. They have. I think six air sacs inside their bodies um, and all of their bones are actually like a honeycomb. So there's a lot of airflow going through that. So when you say this bird is three and a half, four pounds, that's three and a half, four pounds of hollow feathers, right. hollow bones. Yeah. You know, it's supposed to be aerodynamic and buoyant in the air. So it's a big, big bird lots of meat yeah <laughs> it still has a lot of strength you know that that pneumatization or that honeycombing of the bones gives it such good strength mm -hmm. it's great it's really amazing so yeah i mean the, the this is the bird that you can start with um 
They don't come in new with a red tail. This is a second year, third year bird, second year bird. They will come in just all blending in. And <laughs> so, I mean, like I said before, we could we could go on for hours and hours yeah, and yeah. Things about this, but <laughs> when it boils down to it, it's an amazing sport. It will feed your, your soul. It really oh will, God. even if it's through learning about the birds, learning about species. You'll always see something new when we we're trapping. We saw some new migratory things that aren't associated with falconry. You know, watching hawks actually dive bomb into 10,000 starlings and pick off starlings during the migration. So you become an advocate for birds of prey, not just your bird. And that's the type of community that we're looking to build. Like I said earlier, you will be the bird person in your community. So if you do end up getting somebody who says, hey, I have this injured hawk, can you keep it and rehab it? No, but you should have somebody in mind to bring it to. You'll know how to keep it warm overnight until you get it there. So it's, mm -hmm. it really, and if your bird breaks, if it breaks a leg, if it breaks a wing, it is your responsibility to fix that bird. Yep. You know, uh, That's financially. Yeah care for it so you need to know the medical knowledge too it could get sauerkraut which is like a really bad upset stomach that can kill a bird you have to know how to manage those medical things too so yeah. two years isn't enough right. when it boils it down to it for well, an apprentice sounds like it yeah yeah and we know so if we're trapping and we trap a bird that's in poor health that's part of the ethical piece of things Normally, we would just, if we're not keeping it for falconry, we would just trap it and then let it go. But we can't do that. We have to find care for that bird. If we if we take it out of the wild for even a second, we become responsible for that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So, yeah. So. Um, so, and that it kind of brings us back to the ethical part of it. We're really, really big on that just because we are working with those wild animals. We want to make sure that any person out there doing it is very responsible for their birds. Um, obviously there's horror stories and bad apples and everything that's out Always, there. Yeah. Um, but we try not to focus on those and go more towards what's best, best practice. So, and the biggest thing to, is that Tilly and I don't have a bond so much as it is a relationship. Um, it's not like a dog she's she doesn't love me in any way shape or form she tolerates me because i provide her with food and we do fun stuff together <laughs> um that's the biggest piece of it is that that's a good to, distinction yeah so more more like a cat than a dog right oh yeah, yeah. they're very cat like <laughs> uh -huh. when they want something they're there when they don't you can just go away they don't want yeah. anything to do with you so there is a relationship but it's not it's not that way it's not like a pet. No. And she's so, not going to jump in the lake and save you if you fall in. No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. But I would no, jump no, in no. and take her. So I guess she gets the better end of the tree. Yeah. <laughs> so like, really one thing that really stands out is like the diversity, you know, like not even of just the different kinds of birds, but even just amongst red tail hawks alone. I mean, the diversity, like, have you all ever got any of the other uh, color morphs? You know, you got the Criders and the Harlins, and I mean, that's pretty cool. You see that in Illinois? Oh, yeah. Um, yes. So as a matter of fact, we do have a friend that has a Criders and a Dark Morph. I think she has right. two Criders. Two Criders right, and a Dark and a Morph. morph. Um, so. And you can, and the neat thing is, is that even, so generally their immature plumage is just brown, beige, but we've started to see that there's even been diversity in that. You'll have an immature tail, but it'll have red highlights in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just really cool to interact with the bird. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, so we have, we actually have a dark morph out in the Muse as well. She is over 30 years old. So we decided to just leave her <laughs> in her little retirement spot for today's program, but um, on the GLFA website, you'll also see some photographs. In fact, I think the Facebook is probably heavily loaded with some of those. Those. Yeah, we just had a meet. Yeah, we November. just we just finished a meet, and there were some great photos there of some of those critters and the dark morph. So, red tail or hawk is going to be the general term that we use. You can you're going to see more of those dark morphs going to going to be more on the west coast area versus around here, but we do get them in 
during the migration period. So we, you can identify them, but with the, uh, the criders, those are kind of like the ghosts. Um, they're, they even have a different mentality than our local birds here. Mm -hmm. So they might be a little bit more skittish to come into a trap. There's a lot of little nuances with even the different species within or subspecies within the hawk species. Um, but when it boils down to it, do they train up the same? Yeah. Do they hunt the same foods? Yeah. So once you get the red tail hawk down, you can branch off into some of those other specialty morphs because you'll be more ready for them. So they're really cool, but they're a little bit more difficult. They look cool, but I see, see them as more difficult. And they're all on the smaller end of things. Yeah. I, I prefer a larger bird that can more easily do what it needs to do and not have to think so much. <laughs> right. Yeah. Flight styles are a little different with the larger birds. They're, they just crash through everything where a smaller bird will have to be a little bit more aerodynamic to sure. get the brush. And now what about the glove you're wearing? Like, uh, that's a specialty glove or is that just a welding glove? No, you can use a welding glove, but no, these are actually falconry gauntlets. Um, they, this one that I have on is three layers thick. Um, because you can see her feet, especially that talon right there. Yeah. In that can go through just about anything, even a three or four layer glove. Yeah. Wow. So if she's angry, upset, concerned, she's pretty good. She's that's part of the manning process is to get them used to being able to do things like that, where she doesn't grab my hand and try and squeeze it to death. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all part of the manning process. She can go through the glove if she wants to, but a lot of times it's an accident. It'll just happen. The point will end up in a seam yeah. and you're hooding her and her initial reaction to being hooded is to, to grab on because she's afraid she can't, because she can't see, she thinks she's going to fall off. Uh -huh. So, um, but yeah, they can do, but you can use, you can use welding gloves. There's a lot of people that do. I, I don't like that. I prefer these because of the way that they're made. They're made specifically for holding a raptor. Mm -hmm. So there's things inside the way that it's created that locks the, the, the leash and the leash excesses into your gloves so that if she baits, you're not, she's not going out three feet and having to come back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a traditional style thing. It looks cool. It's also warmer because it's leather. So you remember we're out there in the elements, just like you guys are. And it gets cold. Mm -hmm. So if we've got the bird on here, it's warmer for them. We work with each other. It keeps her feet a little bit warmer than that, that welder's glove. And the design of it is to be cupped. So it's actually built so that those seams come together nicely like that. Um, different designs and different weights, depending on the bird, it's more comfortable for a bird to be on a glove. You might see some people with some of these smaller raptors that they're working with to be gloveless um, because maybe they don't hurt you or whatnot we tend to always wear a glove no matter what because it is more comfortable for them they don't feel like they're hurting you they don't want to hurt you and you can see it's kind of like a shelf for them yeah yeah but it just it's not like they're holding they have to hold on to something that's that thing it gives them a little bit more gum to stand on sure sure it's an easier and they're pretty <laughs> they look cool yeah. i like that yeah I yeah. Look forward. <laughs> yeah they can be as pretty and again as expensive as you want or yep. as cheap as you want yeah. i mean that's that's the name of the game we know a lot of people who make them themselves too which i do not uh, but, do you always get them for your off hand your left hand or do you get them for both hands for when one arm gets tired of holding the hawk way out there <laughs> so traditionally you use your left hand to hold a bird um, and that has a lot to do with the own, that brings you down to one hand and most of the world is right-handed. So you're going to be more able to do what you need to do, like tie a knot or pull a just through or something like that with your right hand than you would your left. Right. So there are left-handed falconers that have switched it up. And as long as the bird's trained that way, that works. It's less traditional, but it's more functional for the falconer. Right. But if I, let's say, was to hold that person's bird, 
the bird would not be comfortable because it's trained to be facing the other way. So hmm. it's uh, that's another little thing. They're creatures of habit to the T. I mean, I know when you're driving down the road and you have a local red tail or a bird that you always watch, it'll be there at the same time every day. If not on that pole, a couple poles down, they're very much creatures of habit. And that comes into the training component too, keeping that habit the same every day. And then you'll have a really well-trained bird. So that's, there's so much equipment that you could have. These, the scale is going to be number one. Uh, your journal is number two, right? And all that stuff down. And then all of this stuff can come. You can start with things like um, your welder's glove to kind of get you started. And then as you start to gather stuff, you can upgrade. One thing that you haven't mentioned, but I'm guessing since you all have multiple birds, you probably raise food for them, like pigeons or something. Or uh, okay. All or right. where do you get food? There's actual places you can buy it. Um, ah. We do both. So, because we like to have live things too, because they do, even if you're not out hunting, you can do live game or give them a pigeon or give them a quail live so that they fulfill that need to hunt. So the goshawks specifically, they need to hunt. They need to, they like to kill. It is in their brain. They get really, really weird if they don't get to actually kill something. So if we're on uh, major pain, remember that movie? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a goshawk, huh? That is a goshawk. They, they're fantastic creatures, but they're definitely more needy. When it comes to flying, they're not a weekender's bird. They're, they're they need more during the season. All right. So yeah, back to the food. You said that there are places that you can buy it. So that would be like finding a farmer and uh, developing a relationship. Or where would you where would you normally get food other than just obviously what you get hunting? Um, so yeah, we pretty much take it wherever we can get it from. But our main source is going to be a place like Rodent Pro or Johnson Quail. That are specifically dedicated to providing rats and mice and quail to us and you just order them and they ship them it's not cheap <laughs> and you're talking happen. frozen or even alive they'll ship them live yes um for the frozen we do they do frozen so they'll ship that out in with some what do they call it dry ice packaged really nicely and then they can also ship you eggs if you wanted to breed your own. They'll, you can go ahead and rear those up. If you've got incubators, you can do. Uh, live quail are a little bit harder to come by if you don't do the egg thing. They're also very expensive to ship, and you never know if they're going to make it alive. So, yeah. Well, if you would have got them last week, they would have been little quail sickles. Right. <laughs> exactly. So we do, we do keep quail, and that's just another thing that – so where we keep our quail, there's actually um, – ceramic heaters in there mm -hmm. so we try and maximize maximize the temperature um because they're there we have to take care of them yeah we're going to provide the same amount of care to our other live animals that we do even if they're to be served to the bird for food purposes they should have the best life that they can while they're with us as well so we do provide that. Um, I know this upcoming year, we're looking at doing a bunch more quail as well, getting some eggs and raising those. You can also raise gerbils, mice, and rats for yourself too. It can get overwhelming though. I will, I will tell you that. I, I've done it. <laughs> and the yield on it, at least you know what they've eaten. You know the quality of the food that they've eaten because you are what you eat. So um, high, high vitamin volume and and the stuff that we raise and um even if you don't do it yourself falconers are amazing for trading <laughs> if i have five pigeons and you want five pigeons uh do you have eight quail for me <laughs> so or you can do pen raised pheasants a lot of times for for baggies when you're finding new birds release those and you know they don't fly as well as wild animals but you can still get the bird used to identifying it seeing it killing it all those great things too you can raise those yourself too with a proper amount of land yeah it's just it's amazing i mean if you become a falconer not only are you 
you know, learning a lot about the bird you're flying, whether it's a red tail or a peregrine falcon or whatever it is, you're learning about the game you're hunting, but then you also basically need to be a carpenter because you got to build a whole <laughs> facility for them. Uh, and you might become a quail or pigeon farmer. And, and so there's all these side things, but that's, that's cool. And that's, what's beautiful about it is every different kind of hunting appeals to somebody else. You know, and some are really easy and some people want that really easy. Go out in the woods, shoot a squirrel, come home, fry it up. You're done. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, for like you, all these aspects that that are complicated, but they come together to just make this beautiful thing that you enjoy. And that's I mean, that's wonderful. That's what life's all about. So it is. it's uh, <clears throat> super cool that you all shared, you know, your knowledge with us and your passion and um, yeah, I think uh, a lot of people are probably at least going to look into it. And, and like we've been talking about, it's such a commitment. Just join the Great Lakes Falconry Association, join it for a year before you even decide if you want to even do it yourself, you know, just come and come to the events, come and see everything and, and be around the people. And I mean, that's one thing that we hear from hunters all the time is all the loss of social capital in hunting. And it appears to me that like falconers have this solved because you all have this tight knit community. You're like trading quail for pheasants and ducks. And it's just great. And all the deer hunters, meanwhile, are, are you know, just sad because the deer check stations are, are shut down and they don't have any friends anymore. So it's it's uh, uh, if we could find a way just to combine everybody and then uh, the deer hunters could learn to be as social as the falconers, then might be a whole different world out there. Yeah, I think this is the good start and the education piece and, and you guys doing what you do is really going to open that up and utilizing that virtual platform to do it. Um, it's, it is a, it, it's a community and without that, it's not, to me, not as fun. It can be a solo sport and there are many who are not in GLFA who do practice falconry in Illinois. But I like the community aspect. I like to be able to know that I can call my friend and say, hey, do you have a quail or a pigeon that I, I really need it? And that's in a time of need also, if you've lost your bird and you don't maybe don't have a pigeon or a quail to entice it to come back, you lean on those people. And that's what it's about. Or if there's a medical issue, a lot of time, you know, I've got some knowledge in the background of that and I do get phone calls. What do I do? What do I do? That's what we're here for. And we'd like to keep it as non-judgmental as possible. That's really what the key is. Accidents happen, things happen. Do we want to repeat it? No. <laughs> But together as a collective community, we can figure out what the problem was and whether or not it's a, you know, a wide range problem or is it a me problem? So mm -hmm. it is a great thing to have that community. GLFA is a growing club. We wanna see it grow more. Not everybody who is a member is a falconer. Some of them are former falconers and maybe can't get out into the field anymore, um, but never lost the taste for the sport. So you don't have to get a bird to become a member. You don't have to go through the process to come and enjoy hawking and hunting with us or be a part of the community. And maybe the timing isn't right for you right now, but in five years, you know, you're going to be done with grad school or whatever it is. Go ahead and start your process now. It'll be all the more easier later because you've already done the networking piece. You've been around, you've seen some things. So I would say, even if you think tomorrow's not the day for me, why not jump in, come out hawking with us and see what's going on, meet some cool people. Mm -hmm. We're all a little weird. So put your, you know, put your hat on with that. But um, so are you if you're interested in falconry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard to be interesting if you're not weird, right? So right. let's got to have some of that. And we do have members that just come and it's enough for them just to participate in the field meets that we have and yeah. be a yeah. part of it that way. And it's a lot less expensive and a lot less time consuming to do it that way yeah so it's sure, just experiencing something new i mean something that's uh that's tied to our history but then also incorporates all this new technology and and just getting to see the things that you were talking about you know like rabbits jumping over hawks and and the things that most people never see you know i mean everybody's seen the last episode of game of thrones you, you know in the whole country but you're you might be the only two people that saw that rabbit jump over the hawk yeah that's pretty cool that's special it is. It is special. And we will tell you all the stories when you come out. Trust me. All you got to do is ask. <laughs> so.
So visit the website, take a look at that. It's pretty nice and visit it often. The Facebook page, become a member on that. You'll see uh, a lot of the active members on there, a lot of old pictures, upcoming events. Um, but yes, we, we encourage you guys to come check it out. And if you do come out, when you come out, walk up to people and talk to them. It's okay, ask questions. It's all right. We, we, talk to Bonnie. <laughs> Everybody likes talking to Bonnie. Yeah, we can have very social, approachable. social butterflies. I'm one of them. So come on out and we'll get you talking to. <laughs> uh, I know all of us at the Illinois Learn to Hunt, we're definitely going to be be checking that out and be watching the GLFA Facebook and all the pages and uh, hopefully be doing more stuff with you all in the future. It'd be really cool to do an in-person workshop at some point and um yeah, just like we've been talking about, it's just getting to see new experiences, getting to see these cool things, things that happen every day outside in Illinois. They're right now, there's probably a red tail stooping on a rabbit, and and it's happening, and just nobody's there to see it. So uh, being there to see that and have that experience, and uh, those are memories, those are adventures, and without that, what are we doing, you know? So we're all about it we're going to keep watching and we definitely thank you for for talking it's clear that you all have a lot of knowledge a lot of passion and um they're going to get people excited to go outside and get their binoculars and see what hawks are even sitting in their trees in their back 40. absolutely mm -hmm. even if you're not hunting get in the tree and just hang out and see what you see I and mean, it's very cool to be part of nature so and thank you very much for yeah. offering us this opportunity and we look forward to continuing a relationship with y'all yeah appreciate yeah. it Pleasure's all ours, definitely. So Tim and Bonnie, again, thanks for Illinois Learn to Hunt. And uh, yeah, I know I'm, I'm excited. I'm going to go out and get my binoculars. I've got a Cooper's hawk that hunts right around my my house here. So I get to see him chase little birds and squirrels. And and uh, it's just, it's awesome. I mean, as a hunter, just getting to see another hunter work is fun. And when you actually are a person that has a connection with that in the way of, of you all, falconers with a bird, I mean, that's just super cool. So um, yeah, my hat's off for what you're doing. Love the educational aspect. And uh, I think this was an awesome episode. I think some people are going to get some get some excitement out of this one. Something new. I hope so. Yes. Again, thank you for the opportunity to do it. I'm glad you reached out. Cool. cool. Well, we will stay in touch. That's for sure. Awesome. All right. Thank you.